morning, everybody. What a lovely sunny morning to come to worship today. Isn't it glorious? I can't believe you're not all sitting in the back row with it shining on your back. Uh, don't get any ideas, though. Let's hear the words from Paul written in Romans chapter 8. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? He who, did, who, he who did not withhold his own son but gave him up for us all, will he not with him also give us everything else? And who will bring any charge against God's people? Is, it is God who justifies. Who is, who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, and who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? As it is, as, as it is written, for your sake we are all being killed all day long and we are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. But no, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything in all the creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. And this is the word of the Lord. Is that true? Amen. Let us join in song together as we sing this first song. Jesus is risen. The angels moved the stone and they rolled it away. Please stand. Please be standing. Uh, stay, please stay standing as we sing our next song. Yours be the glory, risen, conquering sun. Endless is the victory over death you've won.
And uh, welcome all of you who are gathered here and uh, all of you who are watching online. Um, if you're doing either, we are broadcasting today from the traditional lands of the Muanina people and together we pay respects um, to uh, their ancestors and to the emerging elders. Um, we also acknowledge the fact that they have just completed um, the, the Uniting Churches arm uh, of First Peoples, the UAICC, have just had their national conference in Darwin. And um, so the girls will be returning soon to that. I'm keen to hear how that all went and I've been following it on Facebook. Um, at the conclusion of the service today... Um, we are going to have our AGM, and it looks like by the numbers here, uh, we should um, easily have a quorum. Um, there's a few, um, not so many decisions to pass perhaps, but some ideas to at least glean the warmth of the meeting to. Um, so Wendy will be chairing that. Um, so uh, at the conclusion of the service, we'll go and grab a cup of tea um, and even if you brought your cup of tea back in here and assembled, uh, we might be able to get our business through in a nice, timely manner. Um, if uh, you're not um, yet an official member of this, then you are quite welcome to stay for the meeting, um, even if you're keen to kind of like uh, um, sort of see what we're all about and, and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, please don't uh, feel excluded. Um, by that. Um, have we another, any other notices? I'm sh I was sure you'd have one, Irene. Next week, Michael will be away, so we're going to get away with um, having a hymn service. So please let me know if you've got any favourite hymns that you would like to, um, to add to the service. And if you've got any little sayings or little verses, bits of poetry or whatever, let me know and we can um, put that in as well. That'll be great. Thank you. No problem at all. Yeah. Um, I can't believe we've got Anne Blythe Cooper with us today, a celebrated director of Anne and Green Gables. There's a few of us that went to see that this week and it was spectacular. So congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> And what a great cast. Weren't they good? Yeah, last night. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and I think Ray went earlier. Ray and Wendy went earlier in the week as well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, but congratulations. Last shows this afternoon. Sorry, it's all sold out. Mm. Wow. Yeah, isn't that great? Oh, and... Um, Stroke of genius to have it during the holidays, so that all the skills schools could uh, could go and see it. And you know, yeah, it's a story that um, many of us have read and remember very fondly. Yeah, even some of us blokes. <laughs> that must be all for notices. Wow, that was quick. Right. Well, we might gather all of our children in, everybody who's under the age of 110, <laughs> and um, shall we hear the kids' bit? Now, I wonder if anyone knows what's happening Tuesday. Tuesday, we've got a public holiday. What's that for? There's a clue. Oh, yeah, 
Yes, very good. Give the lady a show bag over there. Um, it is indeed uh, Anzac Day, and Anzac Day is important to a lot of Australians, um, particularly those who are related to people, which is pretty much everyone. I'm sure that uh, most Australians that have lived their whole life in Australia would be related to somebody who served in um, one, two, three, four or five of the wars that Australia have been uh, involved in. In fact, there may even be more crises. Um, but uh, um, the Anzacs that uh, we um, remember from the First World War were often called diggers. Anyone know why they were called diggers? Well, it's because um, in a lot of the places where they fought, uh, to escape enemy fire, they used to dig trenches in the ground. And uh, you've probably seen um, a lot of um, images of that. Um, but the legend of the, the Australian digger um, is one of service and of selfless sacrifice, just like Jesus, our Lord. It was also one of mateship. There's a photo here of a, of a guy carrying one of his um, uh, one of his injured mates. <laughs> yeah, look at that. I wonder how long he had to carry that full grown man um, uh, to get to the medics um, to get. Um, um, some his wounds attended to. Now, did you know there's diggers in the Bible? Well, Andrew McDonough reckons there is. Um, in fact, um, he tells a story of mateship of um, some friends who just really wanted to get their sick friend to Jesus because Jesus would have been the only one that could help him. But the only way to get into the house where Jesus was ministering was by digging a hole in the roof. Shall we hear the story? Ah, home sweet home, said Jesus. Teaching and healing people is hard work. It's time to relax with a banana milkshake. Knock, knock. He just sat down when, knock, 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 someone was at the door. It was the next door neighbours. Hi, Jesus. Welcome home. We'd like to know more about God. Can we ask you some questions? Oh, sure, said Jesus. Come on in. Would you like a cup of tea or an orange juice or a banana milkshake, perhaps? Jesus served the drinks. And then he started teaching. Then, knock, 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 someone else was at the door. Hello, Jesus. We'd like to know more about God. Can we come in? Oh, sure, said Jesus. Join the party. Jesus served more drinks and kept on teaching. Then, knock, knock, knock. Um, good afternoon, sir. We're the Bible experts. May we please attend your Bible study? Oh, yes, of course, said Jesus. Make yourself at home. <laughs> and Jesus kept on teaching. Meanwhile, in a house nearby, lived a man who could not walk. Knock, knock, knock. Someone was at the door. It was four fantastic friends. Yay, Jesus is home, yelled his friends. Yee-haw, woo-hoo, it's a healing time. They grabbed the bed and flew out the door to Jesus' house. Wee-ha! Woo-hoo! It's healing time! But when they got to Jesus' house, the place was 
packed with people. Oh, carry me home, said the man who couldn't work. I'll never get to Jesus. Ha, said the four fantastic friends. We don't give up that easily. Let's go to the roof. And they climbed up through the roof and down they dug. Dig, dig, dig. (laughs) Until... Crash! And the four friends gently lowered the man to Jesus. Ha, 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 son, you have fine, faithful friends. Your sins are forgiven. Well, now the Bible experts, they glared at Jesus and they were both thinking the same thing. How dare Jesus say that? Only God can forgive sins. Well, Jesus knew what they were thinking. Oh, experts, uh, which is it easier to say? Is it easy to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, grab your bed, and go home? Amazing, yelled the crowd. Yeehaw! Woohoo! Yelled the friends. We told you it was healing time. And the man leapt up and he grabbed his bed and he ran home. Did you like that story? What was your favourite bit? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I can't wait to do that to my home. Oh, sorry. My house. My home is your house. Um, I won't do it to that one. But I've got a thing about poles in the roof. Marvellous things. All of my cars have got one. (laughs) Something about putting a hole in the roof and letting the light come in. But the light was already in the house and that was Jesus. Pretty cool, eh? Yeah. Great story. And what great friends. It just, shows to, it just goes to show that the best friend that you can be to anyone is the friend that takes your friend to Jesus. Because you love them. Let's sing a song, shall we? We're going to sing, put on love every day, never hide your love away. Don't save love for a special day, but put on love every day.
we're now going to hear uh, today's Bible reading, which was written, uh, brought to us by Anne. Yes, road to Emmaus. Well done. <laughs> um, what I think we're reading is Luke 24 and 13 to 20, 35 maybe. We'll just see what happens. <laughs> now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleophas, asked him, are you the only one living in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these, day these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it was just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. Then Jesus said to them, How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, I'll stay with us, for it's nearly evening and day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen as and appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks very much, Anne. Well, not our hearts burning within us. <laughs> I'm actually going to... Uh, I read a sermon I wrote some time ago um, because uh, when I saw the scriptures and um, I, I looked it up in my file and thought, oh my gosh, I'd quite like that sermon if it was preached to me, so I shall be preaching it to you. How bold. <laughs> Let us pray. Loving God, guide our reflections and thoughts on these scriptures that our hearts and minds be opened to part of the unfathomable yet compelling mystery of you, our dear creator and friend. Amen. As so often in Luke's gospel, the actions of Jesus are predicated um, by the guidance of of the Holy Spirit. And there is this awesome sense, uh, and I guess what is for us a precedent of being actioned by the Spirit to the actions of all of the activities of life. In this sense, no actions of Jesus' life were executive movements, but they were all done in discernment with God. 
and through the indwelling spirit within him. And now, resurrected by the spirit, and whilst having a physical form, but a physical form that is not confined to the physical laws as associated with thereof, Jesus walks with Cleopas and one of the other disciples on the road to Emmaus. He probably finds them just as he expected to find them. They were perplexed and they were confused. They have no idea who they're talking to at this point. Not at all. And this suits the resurrected Jesus just fine right now. Here, yet again, Jesus gives us a lesson in Evangelism 101. He initiates the conversation in the other person-centric way that perfectly describes the nature of God. Jesus begins by asking them what's going on in their life. And Jesus initiates with the, the conversation with them, allowing them to describe something of what they know. He'll get into what they do not know or don't know at, or at all at the appropriate time. And this is how Jesus brings the realm of the intangible to the common experience. By listening to their story, he already knows, knows more about and without um, interpretation and without judgment, Jesus wins their trust just through his disarming love. And may I suggest that this is actually the secret to evangelism. It begins with the other's knowledge, the other's experience of God. It begins with the assumption that God has already been a part of this a-religious person's life. The fact that all, I always pin my hat on is that everybody knows something about God. Every single person. Everyone who is acquainted with the experience of love knows something about God. Would you like a scriptural precedent for that? Let's try 1 John chapter 4, verses 7. Here he says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not know love cannot know God, because God is love. The pathway from scepticism to enlightenment can be the culmination of numerous fierce conversations over time, knitting themselves in the mind of the person who's hearing them to what is known with what is newly discovered. It is, the eternal, it is the internal wrestling between what is rationally and empirically true with what is deeply and incomprehensibly felt as true. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you get an opportunity to witness to someone and it does not lead to a conversion right on the spot, then please don't take that on as your problem. <laughs> because you're participating in the mission of Christ and it is Christ that always that seals the deal. So be patient. That incident may be just one of the tiny incidents that leaves to the point where somebody has their own revelation, their own aha. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus invites the disciples to share the story of what they had experienced and then works the events through them um, and with them in the context of the previous experience of, of Jesus that they had had and in their deep-seated understanding of the faith of their ancestors and the teachings of the scriptures that they would have grown up with. And this all happened on a seven-mile walk. What we get 
is only just a, a short snippet of a much, much longer conversation. And by the time they reached Emmaus, uh, Cleopas and his mate must have been drowning in ponderings. I know I'd have been. I always feel that I have a better grasp of a teaching or a new understanding or new information, not on the day that I receive it, but the next day. The next day or at a time where I have had uh, time to absorb it all and interpret it and put it into context with my other learnings. For Cleopas and his mate, though, they had come to the conclusion that this conversation with this apparent stranger had been a pretty good chat. And so they invited him to come along to the place where they were meeting the others. And then once again, gathered there in the room around a table, Jesus picks up a loaf of bread and he breaks it. And at that point, at that point, the penny drops through this familiar action and immediately they were returned in their minds to a meal on a sacred Jewish holiday where Jesus instituted a ceremony that is now central to our faith. And on this first occasion, I wonder whether they were perplexed by Jesus, by Jesus' words and actions in this new interpretation of this, one of their most sacred feasts. In this moment, they get it, 100%. And Jesus is revealed in the breaking of the bread. I remember when I was training, I went to a lecture uh, by a minister who was um, the minister of a church that was planted by the God Squad. Does anyone remember the God Squad? Yeah, yeah. There was a church with infantile Christians, some of whom um, had uh, come to Christ after living lives that perhaps could not have been further away. Um, from a good Christian life the way that we perceive it to be. And this amazing woman was describing her experiences of planting brand new churches of brand new Christians in the city of Melbourne. And I remember her distinctly saying that one of the things that they did with new members to Christ was they got them preaching straight away. And you can imagine the buzz amongst those established and well-seasoned ministry practitioners that were gathered there in the room listening to this amazing thing, what you got them to preach. What, with no, no training, no Bible study, no theology degree, no diploma? How does this work? How do you ensure that the gospel gets orthodoxly and authentically preached without any qualifications? <laughs> she said, yes, we get them preaching straight away, raw and honest. And she didn't even flinch. And her answer was that they celebrate at every meeting also They celebrate the Lord's Supper. And what she said was so insightful. She said, if the preaching of the gospel fails in the sermon, then it always gets preached in the sacrament. When we learnt sacraments... At, in seminary, we learnt that they are like a signpost, like a billboard. And that's certainly what communion is. If sacraments are a sign, there is something that alerts us to a greater... That a, a sign is something that alerts us to a, a greater reality, even though the sign is not the thing itself. Then communion is an absolute billboard a sign of the gospel of God.
I'll never forget the time, and I've told this story so often, when I was delivering the words of institution at this church, and when I raised the loaf of bread to break it, Barry, who was four years old at the time, and only just starting to use words, he speaks up from the back. And as I raised the bread, he said, for you, for you. I get goosebumps every time I recall that amazing experience. So many of you were here that day. The risen Christ reveals himself in the breaking of the bread. This is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. What greater evidence of the love of God can there be than in this action of this gift of life, of this life so cherished and beloved of God but given freely? One life for a billion trillion other lives. I know and I could discuss and wrestle with you over the uh, semantics of substitutory atonement and issues of justice, judgment and cruelty and the many ways that we can intellectually reject the elements of these symbols as morally obsolete and errant in their betrayal of God. Do you know what I'm saying? I've had this conversation with some of you. And I wonder and ponder it myself. Is there an element in our gospel which speaks to a God who deals cruelly But that's not the point right now. Somehow, Christ continues to be revealed in the breaking of the bread. And around the world... Cultures ancient and contemporary through the breaking of the bread, they just get it. These are symbols of our sacrament that herald the cornerstone of our faith. And the cornerstone of our faith is that Christ has risen, He has risen indeed. Let us pray. Loving God, as we prepare our hearts for communion, we confess any thoughts, any struggles that we have, any doubts, any threads of things that we just don't get yet. But we also confess to you there is something most profoundly real and true in the breaking of the bread and in the sacrifice you have won for us. We confess also that our love is not always pure. It is not always lacking in self-interest as yours is. confess sometimes we find it even hard to like people people that you love people that you cherish people that you died for but we thank you Lord for the eternal gospel and the proclamation that though our sins are of scarlet, you have made them as white as snow. And because of this, we can respond with open arms to your invitation to eat at your table. Because the truth is that 
our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us join in song as we prepare further our hearts to come to the Lord's table and to commune with Christ in the singing of this song. Let us break bread together with our Lord. Please be seated. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus was reclining at the table with his friends, and during the meal he took a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks to his Father in heaven for it, he broke it. He then shared it with all of his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Take and eat this to remember me. After the supper, Jesus took a cup and again giving thanks to his Father in heaven for it. He shared it amongst his friends, saying, This is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for the sins of many. Take this and drink it to remember me. For as often as you take of the cup, as often as you eat of the bread, you proclaim my death until I come again. Let us pray. Loving Jesus, thank you for these emblems of life. Thank you for these emblems that also sustain life and nourish it. We pray that these symbols and signs may be blessed by your Holy Spirit. 
that they may be for us, your body and your blood, that we may experience communion with you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I invite my stewards to come forward. Thank you. Today we'll set up two serving points as we have the last couple of times. So when I've served the stewards, um, you are welcome to line up if you're able um, down the centre aisle and file either one side or the other. Receive the bread and wine and partake of it in your own time as Christ leads you.
us pray. Thank you for the gifts of God, for the people of God. Thank you that you bestow that honour upon us. That you who knows us best rewards us the most. So as your faithful people, Lord, as a symbol of the promise that you have made, the covenant you have broken with us, we say the words that you taught us to say. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. peace of the Lord be with you. Would you like to pass that peace to one another? <laughs> peace. I feel another song coming on. Shall we join together as we sing this great hymn, Christ is Alive. of the Lord be with you. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.